and I'm HR Director for IOHK. Most of you know me. Uh, I wanted to actually start with thanking uh, the event coordinator today. I don't see her here, Carrie. Carrie Strong. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Carrie for organizing this today. She did an excellent job. So thank you very much, Carrie. And also, yes. Carrie. Uh, Carrie joined our team a few a few months ago now, so she, she did an amazing job. Thank you very much. Also, I want to point out Mr. Gerard Moroni. There he is, right there. He also had a hand in organizing this. Gerard is our director of operations for IOHK. Man, anything you need, just go to him. <laughs> anyway, sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, we've got a lot of people here. We've got um, a Murgo represented up there. Go, Sebastian, make sure you say hi. We're all on the same team here, so make sure you go in and speak to those fellas up there. We've got Mr. Hoskinson, a man of the man with master plan, right there. Uh, yeah, some product managers in the house. We've got some IOTK people, and I want to actually introduce uh, a new person on our team, is Diane Shapers. She is our. We've changed her title a couple times. <laughs> she is director. Of, what, what what is your title again? No. The head of global global structuring and no partnerships, strategic partnerships. So she she takes care of our strategic partnerships. You're all going to want to meet time. I'm uh we have two different tracks uh going on today. Uh, we have an academic track that starts at eleven thirty, correct? Yep. Okay, so I am going to first introduce our partner, Mr. You mostly know, but I'll give you a little bit of a background. Philip is a professor of theoretical computer science at the University of Edinburgh and senior research fellow at IOHK since 2017. He's the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a past chair of ACM SIGPLAN. Hmm? Previously, he worked and studied at Stanford, Xerox Park, Carnegie Mellon, Oxford, Chalmers, Bell, and Navaya Labs. He has, I was asking him about this today, he has an H index, this is pretty impressive, of 68, with more than 23,000 citations. He contributed to the, to the designs of Hello and XQuery, and is co-author of Introduction to Functional Programming, XQuery from the Experts, and Java Generics and Collections. So I shall turn it over to you, Mr. Wadler. Really? The first ever. The first on the internet, yes. The first <laughs> online computer game. That's amazing. All right, Mr. Wadler. Hi. Hey. Right. Let me tell you why I think why I find them so exciting. If you look at a firm like Google or Facebook and they do something interesting like MapReduce, when they're done with it, they will publish it. What they don't do which is to say, hey, before we use this rather tricky cryptography, let's get it peer reviewed, right? I'm an academic. Academic people know about. It is called peer review. You publish something, you, before you publish it, you get experts to read it and say, yeah, this looks okay to us. And then you get the review and tell you if you've got it wrong. Sad to say, sometimes as academics, we get it wrong. So it's really important to have it reviewed by the community. So all the work has been published. There's the first paper, there's the other. They've all been published in advance of turning them into products. And all the work we're doing, including key is to get it. So Plutus hasn't been published yet in that form, but it was published a while ago, as I will tell you. Now, the other reason I'm excited to work is commitment to using Haskell. I and many other people, some of them in this room, uh, we're involved in the design of Haskell. It's been growing for 30 years. Um, here's the secret, by the way, to doing something great. Do it. Keep at it for 30 years. Your students will graduate, and they will start using it to do great things. 
right? So all you guys here, you know, you're you're playing to succeed next year. When you succeed next year, just keep at it for 30 and you will be fine. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Plutus platform and the main is a really great idea. In it. And it's not my really great idea. It's Manuel's really great idea. And here's the thing. Manuel came to us. He said, oh, yeah, let's look at some, a crowdfunder on a smart contract platform like Ethereum. So he found one that was published. And here it is. It's 81 lines of solidity. That's the language everybody thinks you program Ethereum in. But the published thing isn't just 81 lines of solidity. It's also... 149 script. So what Manuel noticed is that, well, wait a minute, we don't just have one program. You've got the on-chain program, that's written in Solidity, and then you've got the off-chain program, which in this case is written in JavaScript, and they must work together. You have to have something off-chain to drive the thing that's on-chain. So everybody has the problem, but only Manuel noticed it. And we've seen this problem before a language called links, which is about that running on the server on the web and another thing running on the client, and they need to talk to each other. So server is just like on-chain, client is just like off-chain. So we've seen this problem before, and we actually know a solution, which we then adopted. So in Plutus platform, it's all written in Haskell, both the bits that run on the chain and the bits that run off the chain, and everything green here runs off the chain, and then we've got these funny little brackets, which you'll learn more about, which let you write Haskell inside of them. And so this is just a, it's a Haskell, but it's a subset of Haskell. Not everything will run on the blockchain. Everything in Haskell, including both the off-chain and on-chain bits. So he'll tell you more about that, and you'll also learn about Plutus Playground, which lets you try it out yourself on the web. So we've got three different ways of doing it. Playground, an emulator, and of course Cardano. And they all run the same, but you have to run on Cardano if you actually want to spend ADA. Actually runs on chain is not Haskell, because Haskell's this huge language. It has no formal spec. And it's changing all the time. And what when you do something to chain is you want to avoid a hard fork, right? You want to do something that will stay there for a while. So how do you make, design something that's going to be around for a while? Here's an idea. Use a programming language that's eight years old. It's been around since before the first stored program computers. And that's the Lambda Calculus invented by or discovered Use the simply typed lambda calculus, which was written down in 1940. And it's not just something that one person found, right? The reason I use this rather than invent is because in 1935, Gerhard Genson wrote down the formulation of symbolic logic we use to this day, and that's called natural deduction. And in 1969, William Howard published, oh, actually, these two are the same thing. They're exactly identical. The pipes correspond to propositions in the logic. The program the project evaluating corresponds to simplifying, sorry, evaluating the programs corresponds to simplifying proofs in the logic. So this is a principle called, uh, shameless plug here, propositions as types. And if you want to know more about it, you can read about it in Communications of the ACM. That was published in December 2015. But the idea goes back um, quite a ways. Some people attribute it to the intuitionists. Uh, some people attribute it to Howard. Some people attribute it to De Bruyne. So um, rather than giving any one person's name, uh, I refer to his propositions as type. So that's a great idea. Let's use something 80 years old. Well, actually, we use a variant of it. The variant's only 40 years old. Uh, that's called the polymorphic lambda calculus. It was disco uh, discovered by the computer scientist John Reynolds in 1974. 
Um, in fact, it was also discovered two years earlier by the logician Jean-Yves Girard. Uh, and that's the basis for the type systems that you find in Haskell and every typed functional programming language. So that allows you to define something like a sort function and to use it both to sort lists of integers, lists of strings, lists of what have you. So polymorphism is a very important idea. And that's it. Really all that we have, uh, and we've done that to make it future-proof. And because you want some kind of module system, turns out module systems are still something that people are trying to work out. But the um, system F gives you a module system that's quite solid. So as long as you don't add other junk on top of it, it works really well. So we've just not added other junk on top of it. So we've got a 40-year-old programming language, uh, and hope that that will work more here on the blockchain. And there it is. That's the semantics written out for you. I think you've all been given napkins that have this on them. So that's it. That's all I want to tell you. I want to leave you with the idea that if you've got a tough job to do, you should think that this is a job for Plutus. <laughs> We, right. Um, oh, and just for those of you who don't know, often I have that symbol on my shirt instead, but they gave me a special Pluto symbol, which is really great. And you get to, I believe. Yeah. Sorry, I'm being demiked. Okay, so now that you can't hear me, let me introduce our next speaker. So let me do Agelkiasis. After all that work, learning, making sure I didn't screw up. Let me introduce Agelkiasis. He's the um, Chair of Cybersecurity and Privacy at the University of Edinburgh. My friends, the Chief Scientist at IA. And he's also the Director of the Blockchain Technology Laboratory that IOHK has funded here at Edinburgh. All right. Thank you, Philip. All right. Thank you. All right, so thank you everyone uh, for being here today. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you here for Plutus Fest. And uh, uh, let me uh, just take the next few minutes to tell you a little bit about the research that takes place at Los Angeles here at Edinburgh University as well as uh, the research with IHK. So starting with the Blockchain Lab, uh, it's a great team of more than 20 uh, researchers, uh, including uh, Phil, that uh, you just heard from. And, Plus, people working in all areas uh, related to blockchain technology, focusing not only photography and programming, but also aspects related to law uh, and uh, system design. So, uh, the lab was created in 2015 with the generous funding of IOHK uh, and conducts research in all aspects of blockchain technology uh, with also our uh, government funding as you see EPSERC and the European Union Horizon 2020 uh, is among the sponsors that uh, we are doing research with. Um, moving on, the mission of the lab is to explore the fundamental open questions regarding the deployment of distributed ledgers and blockchain technology. And this is done following a rigorous discipline in all aspects. What we care about is doing foundational research that helps grow the whole area of blockchain and distributed ledger systems. And moreover, and quite importantly, what we care about is making that research publicly available so that not only ourselves but other researchers are able to use the res results, build upon them, and uh, create better distributed ledger technology uh, that can be used by everyone. And finally, quite importantly, uh, engage widely in the industry in implementing high-value applications that really make distributed ledger technology reach the potential that uh, it aspires to have. So the Block Technology Network uh, was created at the University of Edinburgh, but it's a wider network created with the support of Input Output HK. There is a block technology laboratory at the National Capodistrian University of Athens and one at Chalk, 
uh, and the team working at these three institutions uh, enjoy very close working relationship. Okay, has funded where uh, researchers right now uh, funded by IHK are conducting research in distributed ledgers. And I just mentioned Lancaster University, University of Oxford, University of Cambridge, University of Illinois, person or whose university, uh, all conducting research in different aspects of blockchain technology and supported by IHK. So IHK research is of course about the people uh, and the great that's a uh, fix that uh, uh, you've uh, uh, heard about related to distributed ledgers and of course uh, Plutus and smart contracts. Uh, just to use about this, there are three we currently working at various levels. They're either part time or full time. They're either PhD students, postdoctoral researchers, research fellows, as well as in house researchers that are full time with IHK. The latter in the period between 2017 and 2018, there were 21 papers published or co-authored by IHK researchers and five papers published by uh, research funded by IHK under uh, review, currently submitted uh, and uh, still going through peer review. This is by far the highest number of any other research and development company uh, uh, in the blockchain space. And all of them very actively engaging with the academic community as a whole, 24 lectures in the last year in academic venues. This is beyond meetups uh, and other workshops that uh, are deep. So something that uh, should not be understated here is the research excellence that we strive for. So our results have appeared the very top conferences and yes, of uh, networks and cryptography and here's just uh, uh, some of the uh, results uh, that were published and are forming the backbone of uh, the technology that is used by IHK just to mention a few of 2019 CCS 2018 IEEE security and privacy 2019 these are the top conference in cybersecurity uh, and uh, they were all venues that uh, our research has so just to uh, give you now a bit of a very quick overview of all the research themes that we undertake um, at uh, ISK Research. Consensus protocols, needless to say, is one very important theme. The Ouroboros protocols that we published uh, in 2017 is one of the key components. Uh, the first globally secure proof of stake protocol, forming also the backbone of the Cardano block. Some of the ongoing uh, very active research areas is scalability. A number of results have already been out in 2018, and there is more coming up in 2019. For the protocol, Roboros Hydra is the code name uh, that we use for that protocol. Interoperability is another extremely important aspect that deals with how is it possible to transfer to this is work we've very actively did in 2018 and following up in 2019 with our side chains for proof of stake work that soon is going to be public. Private and a very important aspect in the context of distributed ledgers. Uh, this is work that is holding on uh, the uh, proof of stake protocol, and Ouroboros Cripsinus is the name. All these systems would not actually work if the right set of incentives is not in place. Uh, and that's why uh, a very um, fair amount of uh, to understand what are the incentives of the participants in these protocols. And finally, governance, um, which deals with how is it possible for these protocols to advance all over Time. So they meet uh, the changing demands of a landscape that uh, is constantly changing uh, and is expected to do so in the lifetime of a distributed ledger system. So all these great structures is really nothing if you cannot program it to do what it is supposed to do. And that's why smart contracts is an extremely important uh, we're extremely pleased to have here Plutus Fest 
and uh, uh, share with you our research uh, on this domain with uh, Plutus and Marlowe. So, uh, thank you very much for being here. Without ado, I'm going to call on stage uh, uh, Charles Hoskinson. We've grown a little bit, huh? <laughs> yes, Thanks, Richie. You know, I don't hang out, it's fair, okay? Oh, just let it hang out there. Sorry, let it hang out. It's fine. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Can y'all hear me? What? Okay. <laughs> Too early in the morning for that, man. Welcome to Plutus. So it's a special event. It's pretty near and dear to my heart. About two years ago, I asked uh, Rebecca to write an ontology for smart contracts, and uh, she had and after started working on the Plutus programming language, and we realized that we were a bit in and over our head, and we needed some proper adult supervision. And right around the same time, Phil Wadler came on board, and we found the proper adult review. But he did some Wadler, so we brought Manuel Chavardi. <laughs> <laughs> and it just all just kind of came together. And, and we said, well, you know, Simon Peyton Jones needs to be involved in some way with this. And we couldn't get him, so we got his son. So we said, well, you know, Simon Peyton Jones needs to be involved in some way with this. And we couldn't get him, so we got his son. So that's, that's good enough. And, and we're way through. Remarkable. You know, you know, you've got something elegant when you can put it on a napkin, and we actually achieve that. Anyway, uh, one of my five things. First, let's talk in markets. And we're doing what we do, and why are we doing what we do? Is that better? Especially for the people in the back. Ah, Jason King. He's got the most epic beard in all of crypto. No man, no man can compete. He also in the United States. Pretty cool. So anyway, we're going to talk about money and markets. And I'm going to begin with a story. I love stories because they kind of uh, are very human in nature. So has anybody heard of the island of Yap? Yap. Marker? No marker. Oh, sad. All right. So Yap. Oh, brilliant. Here we go. Y-A-P. The small Polynesian island. And they're famous for having the world's largest money. So what they would do is they would take the quarry out these giant stone rings, weigh thousands and thousands of pounds, and they'd roll them to their canoes, and then in a very dangerous journey, sail back to Yop, and they'd put it in the village, and they use social traditions to decide who owns those giant stone wheels. Well, somewhere along the way, because, you know, you're while transporting in a small canoe a large piece of stone, a storm is bound to happen, and, and guess what happened? The stone ring went to the bottom of the sea. And then suddenly a magic innovation happened. Because they traded these things by oral traditions, they just agreed in the village that that, that stone ring that sunk the ocean was there and therefore is tradable. So they said, that's the sea stone. And then people would actually own it and trade for it. Even though they couldn't see it, they couldn't touch it, it wasn't there, they still cognitively agreed. The same way. It doesn't actually require physical representation. It doesn't actually require you to hold it to be there. You just have to come to some sort of social consensus that what you're dealing with actually exists and is worth your time and you should be willing to accept it for products and services. So you don't have to back things by gold. You don't actually have to hold it. You just have to agree it's there. That's the nature of money. It's always going to be so. Markets are mechanisms we've constructed as a society to move this value between people. And it could be as simple as an agora thousands of years ago where people meet up, they see something, buy something, it's a complicated concept is still basically the same. You have something, a product or a service, and you're trying to find a price for that product or that service. And it turns out that most of society, religion, most of what we except as reality is kind of built around these concepts, money and markets. So it's no coincidence that 
most of our day-to-day -day thought is in some way constrained or controlled or attached to this, our social lives. So the 20th century was really an amazing century. It was the first century where we started seeing the global world. It was the first century where countries started coming together. And we saw all the systems of the 19th century, the 18th century, the monarchies, collapse. These systems are subject to what's called the sinkhole effect. What the heck is that? Well, you know, a sinkhole doesn't work by being eroded from the top down, gradually creating holes from the bottom up. You know, basically what occurs is over time erosion happens, it drives over the road and falls right into it. And it turns out there's this big pit that you didn't know was there. And there's no greater example, I think, in a picture of how social systems can suffer the same fate than a picture that was taken around May of, 20, of uh, 1910. Do you guys know what happened? You know, you're all English, you should know, the UK. Uh, King Edward VII died. It was his funeral. And nine of the leading monarchs of Europe got together. They assembled for this beautiful picture. They're, they're full regalia. They have their, their sashes and their medals and these prominent, powerful men who basically controlled half of the world's armies. Money. They were the people to talk to if you wanted to get something done. All in the same funeral because Edward VII was related to basically everyone thanks to the Victorian age. Well, just 10 years later, on the closing of World War I, most of them have either deposed or depowered. So here we have this social paradigm of how the world works, who's in control of the types of governments that dominate our lives, our markets, our money, and suddenly it's all gone. Now, was it just the World War that ended them? No, the sinkhole effect was in progress. There was erosion. Decades and decades of erosion. You have Karl Marx, and you had the French Revolution in the American Revolution. Little signs, you're watching them closely, would be good indications that that social order that the world had dominated was coming to a close. Markets are no different, money is no different, and the social system is a bit of a, a challenge right now. You see things like the 2008 financial crisis. You see things like the election of Donald Trump, things like Brexit. All of these events in isolation, you could explain as maybe an anomaly or things happen, black swan events happen. But really, they're the same type of indications as we were getting in the 19th century that the world is becoming different. Why? Silos. Information didn't flow to everybody at the same time. We built cities and palaces and universities to centralize us. In Tokyo, we have Harvard and Cornell and great universities like Edinburgh by the way, older than Harvard. And we'd assemble these things, and the people who lived there got first access to all the things. And they were succeeded and they were in charge. Then suddenly the internet comes around, and what does the internet do? Well, it changes the game. It doesn't matter where you live anymore. You have access to the same information as the king did. In fact, today, all of you have access to more information than Bill Clinton did as president of the United States. Just think about that. Leader of the most powerful country in the world for its time, surrounded by all these advisors, all these departments, hundreds of thousands of people pick up every need to basically give him the information he needs to run things. And you have more information than he did. And that wasn't too long ago. So that's one dimension of it. Information is global. People are traveling. I was just in Las Vegas just about 24 hours ago. I've traveled to over 50 countries in the last few years. This year alone, 30. 30 was, um, so I travel. A lot of people travel. When they travel, they bring with them new ideas. They bring with them different perspectives on how the world ought to operate. And it starts waking people up and saying, hey, the social systems that govern my life, I don't like them so much. I don't like their system over there a lot. Like, for example, being an international businessman. I did business in 16 countries, including Switzerland. I love the fact that I can go and ask the Swiss government for something. I have to talk to them about that. You go to the IRS, it doesn't work that way. And you imagine, it's, just, it's amazing to you that the world's largest, most prominent economy tells you to basically go hire an expert to get it. And you go to a much smaller nation, much smaller economy like Singapore or Switzerland, and you can get clarity in a matter of weeks without having to do that. So I say, why don't I have that at home? If I'm asking, it means it's eroding 
at the way the social system works, and it's creating that social sinkhole. And over time, eventually it becomes so hollow that cars start falling through. And you see them in terms of markets, you see them in terms of civil unrest, you see them in terms of people like Trump getting elected. Now, these types of systems are a special type of system. They're called complex adaptive systems. If you're interested, Scott Payne and other of them are interesting. This is what's called a complicated system. And it's a composition of a lot of well-designed, well-thought-out components. Each has its purpose. And if one of them doesn't work, watch this. is a system made up of simple rules. And those rules emergently produce something very elegant whether that be sand dunes or a marketplace, but they're resilient. So even if certain components don't work, function like this, social networks are like this, governments are like this, you can have something fail and it still goes on. So anyway, what we do at IOHK company is we take a formal risk process and we think about how to build complex adaptive systems for the 21st century systems to better organize your information, your privacy, your money, uh, and so forth. And probably the most important component behind that is how do you represent assets and how do you tell the story of these things? Who owns it? How do they move between people you know, behind it? See, things that Agalos does, he thinks about the ledger and the consensus. He thinks about a lot of the nuts and bolts of how these systems come together. What Phil does with Manuel and the others is things. So when you think about a language, you tend to think of an ontological side of things. They're basically the set of, I can't even read my own properties and the relations between them. There we go. That's the formal definition of an ontology. So in other words, if we're thinking of an ontological view of a programming language, something like Plus or Arlo or Yula, we're talking about who are the actors, the assets, the environments, the events that can happen, and the rules for how they move between people. Okay. So two years ago, we started the research thread, as long as we knew what's possible. And we realized some really magical, innovative things. And they've already been mentioned by Phil, but this concept of saying you need to look at in terms of the blockchain and the server. So the Ethereum world, they tend to focus only on this, and they say, ah, ah here we go, John, and this stuff, uh, that's for the developer to figure out. Oh, and by the way, this centralizes every single application you write. So the minute you create this ride-sharing app, somebody will say, hey, we want to kill Uber. Or hey, hey we kill it. They say, great, here's your Web3, and here's your solidity. Go ahead and put these things together, write some smart contracts, and they write it, you know. And they can't even verify if it works or not. And they say, well, you know, okay, we'll, uh, we'll take some of that logic and push it to the client. Oh, yeah, actually, okay, we need to introduce a matching server, or we need to introduce some other component. And sure, I present okay, off blockchain on a centralized service that if it goes down, the DAP no longer works. Is that decentralized Uber? Is that the centralized Dropbox? Is that the centralized Airbnb? No, it's not. The point is that we reason about a system where we look at all of these things together, we bring them all together, and when we do that, we can actually understand if the system is decentralized. If the system is we can have some common standards. And it was a lot of work. It was about, as I mentioned, two years of it. A lot of stress, a lot of ups and lots of downs, and we learned a lot of lessons along the way. And the speakers that come after me will take a magical and exciting one. In addition to that, we also learned that you need to have special purpose languages for special purpose domains. You can't really just build one language that fits everything. That's where Marlon I mean, Thompson here and his uh, postdoc Pablo. Uh, and uh, they're going to talk a little bit about, well, maybe in some cases it's not good to have too much control and power. You need to spend and that's going to be okay. So ontologically, Plutus is all about basically saying, how do I write software for this new paradigm where I have decentralized infrastructure? Who am I trusting? 
what does it cost to actually run this? And how do I know if it's correct or not? And Marlowe is basically about saying, do that in a very specialized application. But I'll tell you another story. The story of Stanislav Petrov. Does anybody know him? Come on, you all should. He saved the entire world. We all be for this. This is the greatest computer bug of all time. Many computer science professors should know this. It was September 26, 1983. Let's do some setting. For about two years, the United States, since Reagan was elected, started really messing with the Soviet Union. We started flying bombers really close to their borders and messing with their radar, doing the mind games. And there was a culture of fear and paranoia that was brewing within the Soviet Union. They were absolutely convinced that there was a real possibility that the United States would actually launch a preemptive nuclear strike on them. In fact, it shot down an airliner in South Korea just 25 days before this, killing, I think, over 250 people, thinking it was an American bomber. So right around midnight, the Soviets uh, had recently for nuclear launches. Right around midnight, Stanislav, the commanding colonel of this nuclear weapons silo in Moscow, was told that the Americans just launched a nuclear weapon, nuclear missile at the Soviet Union. Now, his training was very clear. If this happens, mutually assured destruction, launch the entire silo. And had he done it, the rest of the silos would have launched, and basically it would have started a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And he grew up in a really brutal military system where you know you were always supposed to do what